Hey, good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. I was going to say something because, like, I don't know what the deal is with this con- this section of the congregation here, but people don't like looking at me. I don't know what it is. It's just the Dave was the only one sitting in that row for a minute, so he must have scared everybody off. Who- who's ready to worship the Lord this morning? All right. Well, let's stand and let's worship Jesus. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be, yes we do, cause he opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God he holds the victory, yeah.
Yeah, come on, praise him this morning, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, we worship you this morning. God, you're so good. God, you deserve all of our praise, all of our glory, and all of our honor, Jesus. And Lord, we praise your name this morning in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, there's joy in this house this morning, church. There's freedom in this house this morning. The King of kings, the Lord of lords is here. He's present in this room. Father, we just worship you. God, with everything that we have, God, all glory, all praise, all honor to your name this morning, Jesus Christ.
that out to you this morning. When he shall come, the trumpet shall. Oh, may I bend in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness solid foundation, God, the rock on which we stand, Jesus. God, this morning we put our faith in you, but we put our trust in you. Well, because we know, God, you are the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, Lord, forever. God, you never change. Lord, you're never ending. So we stand upon the rock this morning. God, we worship you. Come on, just begin to worship him here in this moment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. foundation you're the rock on which I stand God you deserve our praise and our worship this morning now we draw near to you
need you, how we need you, how we need you, Lord. Come on, let's call out to him this morning, church. Oh, I need you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. You hurt your children. He is. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same. There's some promises coming true this morning in this room. God, we stand upon your faithfulness this morning. Lord, we stand upon your word. You are the same God. God, you are the same Lord. God, that healed back then. God, and you can heal right now. 
God, you're the same God that spoke back then. And God, you are still speaking today. You're speaking right now. Lord, so we open our ears to receive, Lord. Father, the words that you would speak to us this morning. Somebody's getting touched right now. as we're singing this, it can be really easy to put the people that we're singing about these great men and women of faith on a pedestal. Moses, David, Mary. Y'all, they were just ordinary people who had faith. I just feel like there are people in this room who feel like they have to be a certain way for God to move on their behalf. Peter was a man who we think of as being a great man of faith, but he denied Christ three times in the night that he was crucified. Jesus had to restore that man. If you need restoration, if you need healing, if you need God to move on your behalf, we serve the same God. respond this morning. Lord, we need you. Now we're just ordinary people, Father. With an extraordinary God. Lord, we stand upon your faithfulness this morning, Jesus. Come on, this altar's open if you want to Stand upon the rock this morning. Let's fill these altars this morning and worship Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm a rock, a oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. Oh, God, my God, I
God, hear the cry of our hearts this morning. Sometimes we think of the miracle working power of God, how He heals, how He saves, how He restores. But one of the greatest characteristics of our God is that He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises are yes and amen. Father, we stand here today and we rejoice. We rejoice that you are unchanging in character, that you're unchanging in your love towards us, that your arm is not too short and your ear is not deaf to the cries of our heart. Father, we thank you today for your presence. And we ask God that your presence go with us. As Moses declared, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, lead us not up from this place. Father, as we move into the word, may your presence go with us. In Jesus' name. And the church declares, amen. Listen, do not be seated today until you greet some people. Welcome them to the house of God. And welcome to all of you joining us online. Hallelujah. Hey, praise the Lord, everybody. God is good. Amen. Amen. Hey, just a couple of quick announcements. Hey, grow groups are launching off. We've got groups launching tonight. We've got groups launching this coming Friday. So if you have not signed up for a grow group, you still have time. Uh, How many in the room are signed up for a grow group in this room? Amen. Good for you. We encourage you to get signed up for one in the back uh, for your area. Uh, We've got several in Owensville, Fort Branch, Mount Carmel, Princeton. Uh, We've got one in Evansville, Newburgh. Where are the coverts at? Wait, if you live in Evansville, Newburgh, Boonville, anywhere in that area, the coverts are hosting a grow group in their home. Or if you just love the coverts, you want to drive to their house, you can do that too. So uh, that, those are launching uh, this coming. Now, theirs is Thursday at 6.30. And so if you're thinking about the Evansville group, uh, the Newburgh group, uh, Thursday nights at 6.30. Uh, I Am Church member class begins October 30th. We've already got 12 people signed up for our next membership class. So we're excited about that. We have a baptismal service scheduled for the 30th. Is that right? 
No, 23rd of October. There's six people signed up already to be baptized. And so if you're interested in being baptized as a profession of your faith in Christ, you get signed up in the back for that as well. And then I'm always going to make my final plea. If you can help in our kids' church ministry, we need you. Uh, Desperately, we need you. So please volunteer with Seth or Britta or myself or Tandy, and we will get you signed up to help with the, uh, the kids' church ministry. How many know that we need to sow Jesus into our kids? Amen. Amen? We need to do that. So if you've got your Bibles today, I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. And uh, we're going to read, we're going to do a lot of reading today. Uh, stories, and then I'm going to give some commentary in between. But every one of these stories points to the point of our message. The message today is called Nameless. And so when we think about uh, when we think about this morning's message, something that Tyler shared about sometimes we think about these great men and women of faith, and we know their names, you know, Paul and Peter and, and Mary and all these folks. Sometimes we feel like we're, you know, there's a reason that God, some, for some reason, or, or opened up his favor over them. And we fail to remember they were just regular people right. like you and I. And so we're going to learn something today that I'm hoping will motivate you to evangelize. Uh, because sometimes I think there are things that we pre- prerequisites we put on ourselves before we feel like we can go share the gospel with others. And so when we get to the end of the message today, I'm going to show you there's two, two prerequisites, and that's it. <laughs> to sharing the gospel with others. But let's start here in Luke 2, familiar passage. I thought, you know, I love Christmas. Might as well go ahead and start priming the pump now, right? Amen. What's that? Is it September. We might as well start priming the pump for Christmas now. Uh, Luke 2, verse 8, it said, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, do not be afraid, he said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on peace. And, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, everybody say, after seeing him. The shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. You know, when it comes to marketing a product, uh, name recognition is key, okay? Popular products, sports teams, even churches are often associated with their founders or special team members. So when I see an Apple computer, I think Steve Jobs. When I think of a Tesla, I see a Tesla drive by, I think of Elon Musk. When I hear Star Wars, I think of George Lucas, right? Whenever I think of the Chicago Bulls, I will forever think Michael Jordan, Come on, somebody. That's right. Anybody else that said any other name, you're wrong for forever. (laughs) When I think of evangelism, I think of Billy Graham, right? So we associate these names. Who said Scott Burr? Bless you. Oh, son said Jesus. There you go. That's probably a better name to remember. Each of these individuals made a name for themselves because of their accomplishments, Their names are recorded on the pages of history, and their influence on society can in many ways be traced back to their specific efforts. When each one of these men started out in their work, however, I feel like none of them had any idea how synonymous that their products and their names would have with each other. I don't think probably any of them had any idea that their names would become synonymous with the products or the effort that they'd put in. 
They made a name for themselves by focusing on their mission, not trying to be popular. That's how they made a name for themselves. Today, however, we live in a culture that is all about making a name for yourself. Being known is the objective. There is no product. There's no creative work or ministry that is the catalyst. It's just collect likes and build followers. So even within the scriptures, we are all most familiar with those whose stories are well-defined and whose names have been revealed to us. Adam and Eve. We all know about Adam and Eve. We all know about Abraham and Moses and Noah and David and Mary and Jesus and Peter and Paul. All these names are synonymous with things that we know. Who walked on water? We know that it was Jesus and Peter for just a little bit, right? You know, we think about who, you know, we think about the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys, and we think about Mary giving birth to the Savior. And so we associate their names are synonymous with stories and things that we know about their lives. We are each of them had a tremendous influence on our faith as we've read and studied their lives, their stories, and their teachings. However, there are many whose lives were just as impactful as the people impactful to us and to the people who around them who managed to go nameless throughout history. In the scriptures, common folk who had been overlooked defined by their broken past and lived the majority of lives in bondage, had their, had their lives recorded or parts of their lives recorded for us to see and hear, but they have remained nameless for 2,000 years. So it begs the question, are we more concerned about having our efforts make a difference or that people remember us? It begs the question. And so when I think about the shepherds, And when I go back to verses 15 through 18, it says, When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And I love verse 17. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. Isn't it interesting that some of the first eyewitnesses of the birth of our Lord and Savior were not prominent, well-known, accomplished aristocrats or prominent religious leaders or even kings for that matter. They weren't the first people to witness his birth. But instead, God chose a group of lowly shepherds keeping watch in a field, not only to be the first eyes, to, the first people to lay eyes on Jesus, but to be the first to spread the word about the Savior's birth. I mean, how would you choose? How would you choose who the first people would be? After the Savior was born, if you were God, and you got to say, all right, I I get to pick who the very first people are that are going to lay eyes on the Messiah. Next to Mary and Joseph, the first people are going to lay eyes on him and the first people that are going to be the first evangelists to spread the good news about the birth of Christ. Who would you have picked? Do you think you would have looked around and went, those guys half asleep in the field, I'm going to use them. Those are the guys that I'm going to pick. Most of us probably wouldn't have, we probably would overlooked them on our way to find the people that we were going to use to be the first people to lay eyes on the Messiah and the first people to proclaim the gospel to others. But instead, God chose a group of lowly shepherds. They had, they, they, they had the most common occupation. I mean, you talk about mundane. This was like the lowliest of occupations. I mean, they weren't slaves, but shepherds were not looked highly upon in that culture. And those are, who God, those are the people that God chose. They had no degrees, no formal education, no specialized religious training that we're aware of. They're, they were just normal, run-of-the-mill shepherds. And Scripture tells us that these shepherds told everyone what had happened. It made me think maybe that's why God chose them. Maybe that's why God picked them. Because God knew that if I show them this, that they won't keep it to themselves. They'll be out there sharing the gospel and sharing the good news with everybody. The story of the shepherds has been read and told thousands upon thousands of times. 
Their efforts and their influence we are still experiencing today, yet not a person in this room can name you one of their names. We have no idea. They remain nameless today. So here's my first point today. God uses nameless people with everyday jobs, with no notoriety or specialized training to be a vessel for his amazing plan of salvation. Nameless people. You see, the the fact is, you know, at the end of the day, most of us, when we open our Bibles, we rarely identify with a Peter and a Paul and and Moses and Noah and these great people of faith. Many of us don't identify with those folks at all. We probably identify more with the nameless shepherds than we do with the prominent, you know, names and characters of the Bible. And maybe that's why they're there. Perhaps God understood that. God knew that most of us aren't going to identify with a Peter, but we're going to identify with a nameless shepherd who has, a, who has an everyday kind of job, who has no notoriety, who has no specialized training. You know, that, that literally God says, I'm going to use that person to proclaim the gospel of salvation to the people around them. Let's look at another person. Very similar type of situation. We're going to need read another long story together, but you've got to get the context. How many know context is important? Amen. I'm looking up a note here in my phone to share with you in a little bit. In John 4, beginning in verse 3, it says, So he left Judea, talking of Jesus, and he returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way, and eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired of, from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. And soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Now, interesting, this, this woman has no name. They just call it a Samaritan woman. I find it interesting that in this passage, they, mess, they, they, mess, they talked about Jacob two or three times, and the story isn't even about him. Mention him by name. The story's about the Samaritan woman, and she remains nameless throughout the entire story. In verse 7, it says, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for the Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus begins a dialogue with this woman, right? At this moment, he's, he starts a dialogue which in itself went, went against every societal norm of that day. So she's just as shocked that he is talking to her as anybody else would be. And he's having this conversation and he says to her in verse 10, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, who do you think, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man that you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while the Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshiped? And Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews." But the time is coming, and indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. 
but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? Verse 28, pay attention to this. The woman left her jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could, this, he, could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Jesus had 12 disciples who likely returned from the very village that she just returned to. When they went looking for food, they probably, that's where they probably went, was to that village of Sychar close by and looking for food to bring back to him. And instead, and when they came back, they brought back lunch. When she came back, she brought back a village with her. In fact, in verse 39, it says, Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear the message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Let me give you my point here. God uses nameless individuals with broken past to bring villages to Jesus. Doesn't he? He uses nameless people with broken past. We know she had a broken past. Jesus highlights it. Now listen, notice what he didn't do. He didn't belabor it. He didn't sit there and condemn her over it. All he did was highlight it for us. Highlight that this woman had a broken past. Listen, I'll guarantee you, every one of us in this room has got a broken past. We've done things, said things, experienced things. We wish we could go back and change. We wish that we could do something different. We wish we could go back. But I can tell you without a doubt that God doesn't look at your brokenness and disqualify you from being a vessel of the gospel to other people. He actually uses those nameless, broken people to bring villages. We know, listen, all the names of all 12 apostles are are written for us in the Scripture. We know every one of their names. We know all of their exploits. We know what they would go on to do to, to spread the gospel. Yet when they came back from the village, all they brought back was a happy meal. They had spent time with Jesus. They heard him teach. They saw his miracles. And the only thing that they thought to bring back was a little food for their rabbi. But when she came back, she brought a village with her. That should encourage us today to know that God uses nameless people with broken past to bring villages to Jesus. Let's look at a third story. This is found in the book of Mark, chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And so it says they arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus climbed out of a boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. We know him as the demoniac or the, the madman of Gadarene. That's his name. That's, we, he doesn't have a name. That's all we know this man by, is that he was possessed by evil spirits. Verse 3 said, this man lived in the burial caves and can no longer be restrained even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles as often as he often was, this wasn't, a, this is often, they tried to chain him up. He snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, bowed low before him with a shriek. He screamed, why are you interfering with me? Jesus, son of the most high God, in the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. The evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. You know, listen, can you just stop for a minute? What kind of God do you serve when the demons beg Jesus not to do something, right? Right? I don't, even, I don't even understand how people follow Satan when, when the, his dominions themselves beg Jesus not to torture them. 
The evil spirits begged him again and again not to send him to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on a nearby hill. Send, them, send us into the pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the, deep, the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was now sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. They chose. Then those who had been, seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away. And to leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord had done for you and how merciful he's been. So in verse 20, notice this. There's a theme among all these nameless folks. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Here is a man that spent a major portion of his life bound up. He was possessed. He was rejected by society. He was physically harmful to himself. He would not have been the man in the community to win the most likely to take the gospel to the world award. Right? You remember those senior superlatives when you were in high school? Most likely to succeed. Not this guy. He would not have been the picture that they put in the newspaper. You know, when we, yesterday I got the privilege of teaching a, a, an ISOM class, a school of ministry class for our district. I was teaching New Testament survey. And it seems like almost every single time that I teach a class, there's always someone that comes up to me to share their testimony. And so yesterday a man came up and he kneels down in front of me and he starts to tell me, he says, Pastor, he goes, he goes I just wanted to share this with you. He goes, it is really, and it's funny because I don't remember his name. <laughs> He's nameless right now. But he said, I'm probably one of the least likely people to be sitting in your class today. He said, six years ago, he goes, I was completely addicted on alcohol. He said, but six years ago, I stepped into church accidentally, he said, and he said, and I heard the gospel, and I got saved, and I've been sober for six years. He had spent a majority of his life before that in alcohol. He was 40 years old, sitting in this class, about to turn 40, sitting in this class. For the last six years, he, went, he, he was sober. He went from needing a Celebrate Recovery program to now he helps run one. And he's getting his credentials to preach the gospel. It's just a powerful story. I'm sitting here listening to this guy talk about how he had spent a majority of his life in chains, in addiction, and in bondage, and needing deliverance, and how God delivered him out of that. And now, and six years later, he's helping lead the Celebrate Recovery Center that he helped step into and got clean by. And now he's going to preach the gospel on top of that thing. Listen, here's my third point. God uses nameless people who spent most of their lives in bondage and addiction. He uses them to influence cities and regions. The demoniac went to preach to ten cities. It said he left there. He said, Jesus, he, he was disobedient to Jesus. I mean, honestly, he said, you go home and tell your family. And he said he went out to ten cities, started spreading the gospel everywhere. Everybody he could tell. See, God will use those who have spent most of their lives in addiction and emotional bondage and even demon possession to carry the gospel to others. We'll disqualify ourselves because of it. I spent, I spent most of my life being a wreck, being a mean to my wife and my kids. There's no way God is going to use me. I spent the majority of my life in alcohol and drug addiction. There's no way that God is going to use me. I've been in emotional bondage because of abuse in my life for all of these years. There's no way that God is going to use me. And he proves from this passage that he will take a nameless person who spent most of their life in bondage, rejected by society, and he'll use that person to share the gospel with cities and regions. 
So let me just close today with a couple points. Let me share with you today the two things that all of these nameless faces of Scripture had in common. Because this is every one of us in this room. You know, when we talk about nameless, you know, I think about something. How many of you have heard the name Mordecai Ham? Maybe it might be one person in here that's heard it. M- majority of us in this room have never heard of the name Mordecai Ham. But how many have heard the name Billy Graham? There's no Billy Graham without a Mordecai Ham. Seriously. Mordecai Ham is who led Billy Graham to the Lord. Let me give you another name and see if you recognize this name today. It's a lady by the name of Wilma Collins. How many of you have heard the name Wilma Collins? How many of you have heard the name Scott Burr? Right? Now, I'm not famous, not a Billy Graham, but there is no Scott Burr unless there's a Mike Marsh. There's no Mike Marsh unless there's a Hansel Vibbert. There's no Hansel Vibbert without a Mrs. Collins. Wilma Collins won Hansel Vibbert in a little revival service. He was the only person to get saved as a young boy. Gave his life to the Lord. Moved to Evansville, started one of the biggest churches, Calvary Temple. Glenn Full, Mike Marsh, Greg Hitchcock. I could go on and on and on and on. The ministers that came out of that ministry there. And those guys went on to win more people to Christ and, and equip more of us and, and go on and on. But if it weren't for Wilma Collins, you see, she's nameless virtually by everybody in this room except me. I know her name. Most of you probably wouldn't have known Hansel Vibbert. There would have been a few of you that would have known that name, but most of you wouldn't have known that name. They're nameless people who did what God called them to do without worrying about recognition. It was all about, I'm going to put the effort in because that's what God's called me to. So all of these nameless faces of Scripture had two things in common. Number one, they all had a life-changing personal encounter with Jesus. All of them. The shepherds had a personal encounter with Jesus, right? The woman at the well, a personal encounter with Jesus. The demoniac, a personal encounter with Jesus. Scott Burr, a personal encounter with Jesus. We all have had a personal encounter with him. So that is your prerequisite number one. you got to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ that changes your life, that causes you to say no to this world and yes to him. That's number one. And here's the second one, and this is the hard one. You ready? They refuse to keep what Christ has done to themselves. That's it. That's all they did. They had a personal encounter with Jesus, and then they refused to keep it to themselves. The shepherds, were, the shepherds could have went back to the fields and just sat with each other and said, wasn't that cool? What a light show we had tonight. I mean, angels appeared and sang to us. We, we, got to, the, we had the star lead us over to where the Messiah was. We got to lay eyes on this dude, man. It was amazing. And we just went back to tending sheep. No, they said, no, we had an encounter with the Messiah. We have got to go tell somebody about it. The woman at the well could have just drug her pail back to the town. You know, empty. And said, and, and, and just went back to, to the house with her boyfriend, and he was like, where's the water? And she goes, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> right? I mean, that, that literally could have happened. But instead, she left her bucket by the well, ran to town, and brought a whole village back with her. We think about the demoniac. After being in bondage for so long and rejected by the cities and the towns that were around there, instead of of saying, you know what, I'm free now, I'm going back to my old life. I'm going back to the way I was living. I'm getting my job back. I'm going back to my family. He says, you know what, what happened to me was too good not to tell somebody about it. I identify more with the nameless people than I do any of the people that have names throughout the scripture. I think about that passage. I can't help but think about that passage with the woman in it where she is never mentioned and Jacob's mentioned like three or four times. It's not even about him. He gets named. She remains nameless. Uh, this, this passage is in, it should encourage you today. 
yeah, listen, I, I, we're, I, most of us in this room, we may not have a, a ministry in our lifetime or an impact in this world where anybody remembers who we are. But it should not detract us from sharing the good news with other people. Because, listen, we wouldn't be standing here preaching the gospel today if Wilma Collins would have looked out and saw just one little boy come to the altar and, and said, you know what, this just isn't worth it. And went home. Right? She said, this isn't worth it. Just, I'm just going to go home. There would have been no Hansel Vibber. There would have been no Mike Mars. There would have been no Scott Burr that was pastoring this church or any of the other 10 ministers that are in our church right now who are being raised up because that is what happens when we share the gospel. You don't know if you'll be the next Mordecai Ham. You don't know. You might be that person that speaks life into somebody and that God actually uses them on a greater scale and people do know who their name is, but they never know who you were. I may know I'm okay with that because it's about the gospel. Amen. Come on, let's stand together around this place. Thank you, Jesus. I can't help but think about that Casting Crown song that just talks about that, uh, that I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul. I've never been so proud. Listen, when I say this, it's going to sound funny, but... Some of you in this room, you would be willing to say, listen, I, I, I identify more with the demoniac than I do with Peter or Paul. I identify more with the woman at the well than I do with Mary or Joseph or anyone in the scriptures. I identify more with the lowly shepherds than I do with Moses and Joshua and Noah and, and the great uh, prophets of the Bible. I, I just identify more with them. And can I tell you that, that I think that's perfectly fine. Because all of those people had one thing in common. They had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And then they refused. They refused not to share it with other people. Father, my prayer today is that every one of us in this room, we've had an encounter with Jesus Christ. So my prayer today, every head bowed, every eye closed in this room, maybe you came into the house of God today and say, Pastor Scott, I've never had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. I've never received him as my Lord and Savior. I have never accepted his forgiveness towards me. I have never repented of my sins. But today, I feel it. Today, I know that I need to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand into the air. If you're watching online, just say, that's me, and we will pray for you. But I just want on anybody that's in this room or watching us online, that if you need Jesus, this is your opportunity to put your faith in Christ. Father, then I have to believe today, God, that those who are present, Father, those who are present, God, have had a personal encounter with him. So, Lord, this is my commission now. I pray that you would embolden every person in this room to refuse, to refuse not to go and share the good things that have happened to them through Christ with other people. Lord, I thank you today that we will, most of us in this room will remain among the nameless of history. But may the impact of our testimonies reach thousands. Father, we thank you for it today. We ask you bless the tithe and offering. And we ask that you bless those that come to the altar for additional prayer. In Jesus' name. And the church declares, amen. Hey, two things. Discipleship class begins over at the uh, FLC. Hey, listen, we've got October 2nd will be our last class over there. And then we'll be back over here on the 9th to, to restart our normal Sunday school classes. And then we do have prayer service tonight, 6 o'clock. God bless you guys.